Hello, and welcome to this penultimate episode of Medieval Beginnings. My name is Irina Dumitrescu, a contributor to the London Review of Books, and I'm joined, as ever, by Mary Wellesley, who also writes for the paper. Hello, Mary. Hello, Irina. In the previous episode, we were in a world of fleeting lyric and poetry, examining tiny snatches of lost song, mirth, and lament. In today's episode, we enter a riotous, carnal, theatrical text. We will encounter salty sailors, a sexy gallant, some cartoon villains, and, at its heart, a compelling image of female authority. We are talking about the Digby Mary Magdalene play, an expansive theatrical experience featuring one of the most charismatic saints in Christianity, a reformed sinner who was wildly popular in the Middle Ages and who continues to fascinate audiences today. So Mary, what is the Digby Mary Magdalene play? Well, it's uh, a play about the life of Mary Magdalene. Um, So it's a hagiographic drama. It's the story of the life of a particular saint. As a genre, it's probably somewhat unfamiliar to modern audiences. We don't have very many examples like it, for example, in Renaissance drama. In places, it reads a little bit like a kind of late Shakespearean romance. There are some sort of magical elements, which we can talk about later. And it's very different as a theatrical artifact to anything we might expect as a modern audience. The play comes from East Anglia. Uh, We can tell that by the language. There are some specific uh, spellings that indicate that it was copied by a scribe who was probably using a kind of dialect um, that comes from somewhere near Norfolk. We should just say that East Anglia in this period is an incredibly wealthy area of England as a result largely of the wool trade. And it's partially because of this uh, prosperity and the concentration of devotional activity that a very large number of the surviving dramatic texts from medieval England actually come from East Anglia. The form of the play is in some ways quite unusual. In the manuscript that this play is is preserved in, we also have another play of a saint's life. It's a conversion of St. Paul. And then we have a couple of examples from uh, medieval Cornish drama. But otherwise, these are the only examples from medieval Britain of the saint's play. And so it's quite hard to tell whether this is characteristic of the form or whether it's playing with formal expectations. Uh, The manuscript itself is actually early 16th century, and there is still sort of scholarly work ongoing about the circumstances of its copying and the collection of the different texts altogether within this one book. Okay, Irina, so what is the story of the Digby Mary Magdalene play? Oh my goodness. Well, there's there's a lot. Let's see if we can reconstruct this uh, this all. A lot happens. So at the beginning, we have various figures um, of power just kind of giving speeches, some of the really set speeches. So the Emperor of Rome, um, Cyrus, a feudal lord, was Mary's uh, father. We have Herod. We have all kinds of figures basically just talking about how powerful they are, which is a lovely setup to discovering a different kind of power in the play. And Mary at the beginning is quite virtuous. She's just one of Cyrus's children. Um, He gives a little speech about how he's going to leave his belongings to his three kids. And then he dies. And she's in mourning. She's really suffering. You get a sense of how oppressed she is by the emotion. And the and flesh, the uh, sort of allegorical figure, tempts her while she's in mourning to turn towards a life of sin. So she's convinced that the life of the flesh will be a kind of healing for her, that it will basically, basically she's a person distracting herself from sad emotions with wine and sex, you know, who who hasn't done that? And she basically, you know, she's sort of seduced by this gallant figure whose name is Curiosity, um, a kind of, you know, sense of medieval desire to know and to experience, uh, which is, which is sinful. And ultimately, she winds up in a garden waiting to have sex with any passerby. This is kind of as low as she gets. Uh, We never really see her as a sex worker or anything like that. We don't really see her in lots of embraces, although this certainly could have been done in performance. But she's, she's just in the garden waiting for erotic experience. She's saved by Jesus, who drives the 
demons out of her and makes her truly whole and healthy once again. And then her brother Lazarus dies. And Jesus, as we know, raises Lazarus from the dead. He is then crucified. Mary and two other women go to his tomb, and they are the first to see him resurrected. And then she begins a whole new set of adventures. I mean, quite a lot has happened by now. And she goes to Marseille by ship. And and there's an interlude with some some saucy sailors, we should add. Yeah. They're always saucy sailors. So the, yeah, all along there are interludes, right? There are devils having conversations. There are angels popping in and, and talking. So there's a lot of action in this play. We have to really imagine lots of scenes intercutting um, into the main narrative. So she goes to Marseille where the king is a kind of proto-Muslim figure, you know, the sort of cartoon Muslims that are that often appear in in Western medieval literature. And she marries an apostle at this point and she converts him and his wife. She proves her sanctity by helping the Queen of Marseille get pregnant, uh, which is a kind of classic romance motif. So, you know, the natural thing is uh, to get baptized, but for some reason, the King of Marseille feels that he needs to do this in Jerusalem and to go get baptized by by P- St. Peter himself. Obviously, uh, obviously uh, his pregnant wife decides to go along on this arduous journey. Why not? Yep. Although the sailors seem to think it's a bad idea. And she goes into labor in while they're at sea and seems to die. Uh, a storm is brewing. The, the sailors are afraid and they may, they want to throw her overboard because they think the storm is taking place because of the dead body on board. And he convinces them um, to let uh, him drop off her body and the, bo- and the child, the newly born child who is doomed to die for lack of food on some kind of rock in the middle of the sea. He go, gets to Jerusalem, spends two years seeing all the sights, uh, getting baptized by Peter, learning everything about you know what he has to know to be a Christian. And on the way back, they pass the same rock. And lo and behold, he looks more closely and the kid is there. The two, his two-year-old son is still alive. Uh, they go to pick up his wife, who has been in some kind of weird zombie trance state, and she wakes up again, and she tells him that she went along on his entire journey with him, with Mary Magdalene as her guide. And, okay, they get back to Marseille, where Mary Magdalene has been regent this entire time and ruling Marseille in their name. And this seems to be sort of the the end of Mary's active career. She now goes into the desert and spends 30 years there, uh, where a priest eventually finds her as a kind of desert hermit. This has resonance, as we'll talk about later, and gives her the Eucharist, and she finally dies. So And ascends into heaven. And ascends into heaven, right. So that's the short version of the of, of the story. So and we should also, I think, spend some time with the sources because anyone who knows their scriptural text or knows a little bit about the scriptural text will know that quite a lot of this doesn't appear in the Gospels. So so what's actually happening here? What are the sources? Well, Mary Magdalene is a funny figure because she's she's really a composite character for most of the tradition, which is to say she appears in the New Testament. There are passages which historians of the Bible consider to be relatively certain, right? She she seems to come from Magdala. She's a woman. Uh, Jesus drives uh, demons out of her, so it's a kind of more complicated healing exorcism. She travels with Jesus to Galilee. All four Gospels uh, say that she's present at the crucifixion, and in two of the Gospels, she's the first person to whom he appears after the resurrection. So she has this extremely, you know, quite a important role in the New Testament. But that's not quite the figure I think a lot of people know today. And the reason for that is Gregory the Great, who basically identifies her with a couple of other women in the New Testament, namely the sinner who anoints Jesus in the home of Simon the Pharisee, and with Mary of Bethany, the sister of Martha and Lazarus. So Gregory has a homily who, which makes this kind of composite character in which she becomes a figure for 
uh, sinfulness, you know, sex. She's that. This is the sex worker version. This is the prostitute, if you like, but also a figure for penitence and love. And she becomes one of these great saints who embodies the power of love, in, especially in the later Middle Ages. But that's not enough. <laughs> that's just the early Middle Ages, right? And that's the sort of story that accrues to her in the early Middle Ages. There's a longer version of the Mary Magdalene uh, legend, which is popularized in the Jacobus de Voragine's Legenda Aurea, which is an extremely popular collection of saints' lives. And in that story, she gets a chunk of Mary of Egypt's story attached to her. And this is why she goes out into the desert and she spends three, 30 years in the desert and she meets this weird priest there. So that basically, I, we have almost another Mary glommed onto her. And Mary Magdalene gets her story as well. And the sort of, you know, the Eucharist and, and the, final, the final death. Uh, so this is extremely popular and... The Legenda Aurea is translated into English. It appears in print. There are multiple editions. Um, and so it seems this is something, this is definitely something that the Digby author or authors are drawing on. Um, so we have this really complex figure because all of these other Marys and other figures have sort of contributed their stories to her story. And what you get in the end is um, a really wild life all, all put together. Thanks for listening to this extract from Medieval Beginnings, a close reading series from the London Review of Books. To listen to the full episodes and all our other close reading series, sign up to our close reading subscription. Go to lrb.me forward slash close readings or click on the link in the description.